I watched in boredom, as yet another drop of sweat ran down my forehead and landed with a splash onto my rifle. This was my first time holding a gun, and I hadn't anticipated how heavy it would be. I looked over to my colleague, who in the blistering midday sun, frantically applied the sunscreen to his pale English skin. Glancing down, I scanned the forest floor below the dense jungle canopy, fixing my gaze on the large chunk of elephant meat we had placed as bait. We had been sitting up in that contraption for hours by that point, waiting. I believe it's called a tree stand, but by its size, it might as well have been a small watchtower. In case you're unfamiliar, a tree stand is a small platform that hunters attach to trees in order to gain a high vantage point over their hunting ground. The tree stand we were waiting in consisted of a fairly large rectangular platform with metallic rails running around its edges. How these grunts managed to install this thing all the way up here is beyond me. Damn mosquitoes. Dr. Fernsby, my boss, blurted out under his breath as he squashed the buck under the palm of his hand. I already knew he wasn't cut out for this environment. Fernsby was a veterinarian based out of Oxford. He specialized in the treatment of exotic animals, specifically reptilian and avian species. Though, so, I quickly came to realize that his specialization came strictly within the comforts of a lab or a clinic, and not from the actual field. I was at the time a 25-year-old grad student and had been working part-time as Dr. Fernsby research assistant for a few months before he requested I accompany him on this expedition, even prior to meeting him for the first time back in January. I was already familiar with his work. He was a talented veterinarian and a proficient animal consultant to a number of wildlife preserves and zoos worldwide. It came to me as no surprise when I heard how adamant our employer had been that Dr. Fernsby be on board with the project. The doctor was the best at what he did. With a series of sudden and loud metallic thoughts, my eyes quickly darted over to the large container fastened on the back of the flatbed truck that had arrived with us. It started shaking, violently bobbing from side to side with each thud, as if something within was trying to break free. And the only things that kept the crate in its place were two sets of yellow ratchet straps, which seemed to loosen ever so slightly with each bang. The fact that the container hadn't fallen off during the treacherous ride over was a miracle in itself. Then, two men dressed in camel pattern tank tops and cargo pants promptly exited the vehicle and made their way toward the shaking container. They each had something long and black in their hands, but from the distance they were at, it was hard to make out details. What do you think they have in there? King Kong? I asked Dr. Fernsby, trying to make light conversation. We hadn't spoken to each other a lot these past three hours. Huh? He replied confused, cocking his head to look at me. It seemed as if I had broken him from some sort of trance. In there, in that container, I said, pointing toward the truck. Oh, he said. I don't know. I looked to my side at the other men up in the tree stand with us. A big game hunter from South Africa named Arno. I didn't know much about him, except that he had a reputation of frequently hunting large endangered mammals like elephants, giraffes, rhinos, and even lions on some occasions. All for sport. From the moment I met Arno, I could tell Dr. Fernsby took a dislike to him. And so did I. Arno sat, completely still, and looking through the scope of his rifle unfaced by the extreme heat and excess of insects. I wondered whose genius idea it was to pair a couple of veterinarians with a trophy hunter. Then, a loud humming, like that from an engine, gradually grew louder and louder. I figured I would soon get the answer to my question. I looked back over to the two men in tank tops beneath us. They had now climbed onto the back of the truck. They each unlocked a series of hatches on the container and inserted the black object through one of the various openings. A chorus of loud crackling sounds emanated from the container, along with rapid flashes of blue light. For a moment, the thoughts from within became more aggressive than ever, almost knocking one of the men over. 
But as the crackling continued, the container gradually calmed down. The thudding died out. And peace had once again returned to the jungle. The loud hum of the approaching engine also came to a stop, and the sound of a car door opening and closing could be heard below. It had been very clear from the start that these guys weren't involved with any kind of wildlife preservation group, as they said they were when they first reached out to us. When masked men wielding assault rifles greeted us at the runway immediately after stepping off the plane, I knew Dr. Fernsby had made a serious lapse in judgment in coming here. Though, and the fact remained, they hadn't hurt us, nor treated us badly. Not yet, anyway. If anything, they were quite accommodating. These men were surprisingly well-spoken and mannered, despite their frightening appearances. The platform started shaking as someone had begun making their way up the flimsy rope ladder. I looked down below me and saw a figure rapidly ascending. Her apologies for the way, gentlemen. The man panted as he had reached the top of the ladder. He stretched out his hand and introduced himself as Mr. Adebayo, our employer. He was a tall and handsome African man who, despite the intense heat of the jungle, wore a white three-piece designer suit. I am pleased to see my men were able to transport you here safely. I do hope you had a pleasant ride. The eccentric man said with a smile. I looked down at the deteriorated Humvee we arrived in and scoffed. Mr. Arabayo's gaze shifted toward Arno, specifically his rifle. Arno took notice. Don't worry, Carfentanil, Arno said reassuringly in a thick South African accent. Confused, Mr. Arabayo raised his eyebrows. Tranquilizer, Arno added, removing a cylindrical dart filled with a clear liquid from his vest and holding it up. Good, Mr. Arabayo replied. And those? He gestured toward the munitions belt tied around his shoulder. It was filled with all kinds of bullets, from low caliber to high, and everything in between. Plan B, Arno said. Mr. Arabayo pointed over to me and nodded toward my rifle. What about him? He asked. Tranquilizer as well, sir, Arno replied. Gave it to him this morning. Pleased with the answer. Mr. Arabayo stepped back and smiled. I can't stress enough how important it is that we bring it in alive, gentlemen. Unharmed. That is why you two are here. Arabayo said and pointed to Dr. Frensby and I. If anything should go wrong, I trust your expertise within this field should come in handy, doctor. A brooding and quizzical grimace formed across Frensby's face. And what exactly are we supposed to be bringing in here? He inquired. Lions? Bigfoot? Adebayo chuckled. Oh, I can do it justice by describing it, doctor. You have to see it with your own eyes. Besides, I wouldn't want to spoil all the fun. You might not dare to stay the night otherwise. Adebayo said with a smirk. Don't you think it's important that we know what we're looking for? Arno questioned with a hint of irritation in his voice. I could tell he wasn't one to play games. Oh, trust me. You will know when you see it. Adebayo once again vaguely replied. He took a step forward and continued. Livestock found mutilated, a village in ruins, and four people reported missing. This is not a creature from our world. I can assure you of that. I exchanged concerned looks with Dr. Fernsby. Without saying a word. I could tell that he had only one thing on his mind. This guy's crazy. Now, any more questions? Adebayo asked. And yet again. A loud, metallic thud filled the air and sounded throughout the jungle. And I could hear the men in the tank tops shouting at each other. What's in that cage? I asked, pointing down at the container on the truck below. Call it... Plan B. Adebayo smirked and winked at Arno before he turned around and walked toward the ladder. It will be night soon. I expect all will be revealed sooner rather than later. And with that, Mr. Adebayo climbed down the ladder, got in his jeep, 
and drove off through the dense vegetation until only the humming of his engine could be heard. And then, that too faded away. And the three of us looked at each other perplexed, though we didn't say a word. Arno got back into position and resumed scanning the jungle for movement. As long as I'm still getting paid, he sighed. As time progressed, the shadows drew longer and a beautiful orange hue dyed the evening sky. Yet, there was still no sign of whatever animal we were looking for. The chunk of elephant meat we had placed out hours ago had started decomposing and a foul stench radiated throughout the rainforest. As far as I could tell, Arno hadn't moved at all during the past couple of hours. I almost refused to believe he was human. I looked down to the two men by the truck below us. They had set up a couple of hammocks in which they had fallen asleep an hour ago. Things seemed to quiet down in the jungle as well. Fewer birds were singing now, and I hadn't heard movement from within the cage in what felt like forever. As I sat in the evening sun, taking in the serene rainforest that surrounded me, a faint scratching sound came from directly behind me. Curious, I turned around and caught a shadowy glimpse of movement in the corner of my eye. I searched the nearby branches of the trees next to ours, but I saw nothing. Then, the shadow appeared again from behind one of the branches of a tree no more than 15 meters away. Before I could get a closer look, it once again disappeared from view. Something was traversing the forest canopy at incredible speeds. Slightly alarmed, I stood up and walked to the back of the tree stand in order to get a closer look. Neither Fernsby nor Arno had cared enough to notice my commotion. The shadow moved again, leaping from one branch to another, and then disappearing once again. It was even closer this time. The low evening sun made it difficult to make out any details in the gloomy jungle. A high-pitched screech filled my ears as I saw the shadow leap out from behind the tree and land on a branch just a few meters away. Fernsby had definitely heard it by now, and he turned around to see what was responsible for the awful noise. The creature growled, and in the dark shadows of the rainforest, I could barely make out its features. It was sitting there, perched on a thick branch, holding something with both its arms, eating something. The animal was vaguely humanoid in appearance and covered in sleek black fur. Two bright specks of light reflected from the creature's large eyes. I inched closer to the metal rail on the edge of the platform in order to get a better look. Another shadow appeared on the tree to my right, and then another one to my left, then another. The animal scattered across the canopy and drew closer to our tree stand. I felt a gust of hot air brush down the back of my neck and I swiftly turned down to see a large dark face with grinning teeth staring directly at me. I'm ashamed to say that the sight startled me so much that I nearly lost my balance and fell over the guardrails. Up close, there was no mistake in the identity of the creature. It was some species of monkey or ape. And up close, it was rather cute as well. Fernsby chuckled. Bonobo, he said with a smile. Probably juvenile, judging by its size. I stretched out my hand to pat it, but Arno protested. For the first time since Mr. Adebayo had left us, Arno moved. He turned around and looked me dead in the eye. Don't touch it. They are a nasty and vicious sort. You're better off leaving it alone. He warned me as he rolled up his sleeve and showed a thick line of scar tissue that ran down his forearm. You don't want to lose an arm, do you? As though feeling that he was somewhat over-exaggerating the inherent danger, I still retracted my hand and took a step away from the innocent-looking ape. For a brief moment, the three of us all stood in the rapidly fading sunlight and stared curiously at the troop of apes. Dr. Fernsby watched in awe as the apes jumped around and played with each other. Fernsby had treated a couple of primates at the clinic back in Oxford, 
but seeing them thriving in their natural habitat must have given him a sense of childlike wonder he'd forgotten he had. Suddenly, one of the apes froze and tilted its head. Its large dark eyes widened and it began uncontrollably screaming. Soon after, the others followed. They had gone crazy by the looks of it. Something had startled them. The primates scattered across the trees, and as suddenly as they had appeared, they were now gone. At the same time, a flock of exotic birds caught and began rapidly flapping their wings in unison, flying above the canopy away from the forest. And they too seemed to be fleeing from something. A wave of dread washed over me. The air felt thicker now, and the atmosphere had taken a more sinister tone. I heard Arnold curse quietly under his breath, and then he cursed loudly. What's the matter? Dr. Fernsby asked, but to no response. Arnold picked up his rifle and frantically scanned the forest floor below. No, 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 he blurted out. I placed my hand on his shoulder and asked him what the problem was. But again, he paid no attention to it. Damn it, Arno, just talk to us. What's wrong? I shouted at him, greatly annoyed by this point. The meat, Arno finally said. Confused, I further inquired. Meat? What are you talking about? The elephant meat, the bait we placed, he replied. What about it? Dr. Fernsby asked, worriedly. Well, bloody look at it. It's gone. Night fell swiftly in the jungle, and a thick cloak of darkness had tripped itself over the clearing we had been watching. The only light visible came from the faint rays of moonlight that occasionally shone through the jet black overcast above. For the past 20 minutes, Arno had been fumbling with one of the field radios he carried trying to get into contact with the two sleeping mercenaries below us. But it was to no avail. Even if they were awake, I doubted we could get the radio working and get into contact with them. Whenever Arno tried broadcasting, only static interference could be heard coming from the other end. At one point, he even changed the channel in order to get into contact with Mr. Arabayo, but the signal didn't seem to be strong enough as he received nothing but static. Maybe it's due to those clouds? Dr. Fernsby theorized, pointing up at the dark storm clouds that drifted closer by the minute. I can go down there if you like. Wake them up. I offered. But Arno protested, saying it wasn't worth the risk. Arno abruptly shouted, breaking the calm silence of the forest. He waved his arms up and down and shouted again. Fernsby shushed him and tried to get him to calm down. You're scaring it away. Stop that, he warned Arno. Down below, there was movement in the two hammocks. It worked. Shut up, Fernsby said again. You're scaring it. The animal, you're scaring it. Arno stopped once he noticed the two mercenaries were now awake and he had gotten their attention. He turned his head toward the doctor. Or attracting it. He responded to Fernsby. The men in tank tops promptly rushed to their radios, but only the crackle of static could be heard. With a greatly over-exaggerated gesture, Arno pointed over to where the bait had laid. The men turned, and now too noticed that he had disappeared. One of them raised his hand and gave us a thumbs up, while the other walked to the back of the flatbed truck and started unlocking the hatches on the container. What are they doing? Fernsby asked Arno, who just simply replied with, Plan B, I presume. The large metallic door of the cage swung open, and the other men walked over to assist. They each grabbed a large chain and started tugging, pulling whatever was attached to it out of the cage. Meanwhile, I noticed three large drops of water splashing down on the railing in front of me, followed by a loud rumbling and an additional two more drops. Down below, a deep growl could be heard as the two men had dragged whatever resided in the container out in the forest clearing. Attached to the chains 
walked a large dark figure on all fours. Clearly the two men must have given it some sort of anesthesia, otherwise the animal could easily escape from its confines. Instead, the sedated animal walked slowly and without rhythm. It looked as if it could fall over at any moment. Once the men had pulled the animal out in the middle of the clearing, they each took their chain and bolted it down in the ground on opposite sides, binding the animal in place. A ray of moonlight shone through the thick clouds above, and we could now see the creature clearly. The poor animal was a large silverback gorilla, grotesquely tied down by massive chains on the forest floor below us. It was being used as bait, life bait. I could see that Dr. Fernsby was furious. He turned to Arno and profusely yelled at him. But Arno shifted the blame. He didn't know what plan B entailed either. Though he wasn't directly responsible, I could see in his eyes that he had no remorse for the poor ape. He had probably hunted worse, done worse. The slow patter of raindrops on the triangular floor of the tree stand had started picking up its pace, and streams of water ran down its corners. The rain combined with the inky blackness of the jungle made it hard to see what was going on in the clearing. A loud wailing sound could be heard from the gorilla, and as the two men walked back to the truck, the animal let out a soft whimper. It was heartbreaking, but there was nothing I could do. Not from up here, not with these men, and not in this rain. The mercenaries proceeded to climb inside the front seats of the truck to seek shelter from the rain. Can you see anything? I asked Fernsby, who promptly replied with a firm no. The storm picked up, and seeing through the thick wall of the torrential rain proved impossible. Besides from the heavy splashing of downpour, the only sound that could be heard in the jungle was the cries from the chained-up ape. Night vision goggles, bottom compartment. Arno said and tossed the damp canvas back over to me. Give me a pair as well. The jungle lit up in a bright green fluorescent light as I put the goggles over my head. An electronic whirring sound emanated from the device. As though the rain still made it hard to see, I was able to get a view of the whole clearing now. I could see the gorilla sitting on the wet mud, tugging at its chains, trying to break free. It wailed through the rain. Then, a familiar stench crept its way up my nostrils. The smell of decay. The same smell that just hours ago had polluted the fresh jungle air. I recognized it to be the scent of the decomposing elephant meat. But, that was impossible. It had been gone for quite some time now. However, now it was back, and it reeked stronger than before. I swiveled my head back and forth, scanning every tree and bush that surrounded the clearing. No signs of life, and no signs of the source of the smell. A deep rumble sounded throughout the rainforest, quickly followed by a flash of lightning. With the night vision goggles, it was almost blinding. I rubbed my eyes and then put it back on, continuing to scan beneath the canopy. Ever so slightly, the tree stand trembled. At first, I thought nothing of it, until it shook again, harder this time. I asked Fernsby and Arno if they had felt it too, and they brushed it off as if being the workings of the wind. Satisfied with the answer, I went back to keeping watch, until the foundation of the stand was yet again hit with a powerful vibration. A faint boom sounded, followed by the tree stand once more swinging back and forth. That didn't sound like thunder, I whispered to the doctor. The wailing of the gorilla filled my ears, and I focused my gaze on the poor primate. It seemed alarmed. The gorilla desperately tucked at his chains. The goggles whirred as I zoomed in on the animal. The ape was intently looking behind itself, over its shoulder. And then it looked up, toward the wall of dense green foliage. You see that? 
Arnold asked, tapping me on my shoulder. I adjusted my goggles and looked in the direction he pointed me at. At the edge of the forest, slightly to the left behind the gorilla, the tree line swayed unnaturally fast compared to the rest of the surrounding plants. Tall palm trees and large bushes got pushed from side to side, and the dense greenery made loud cracking sounds as if a thousand twigs had snapped at once. Something big was moving through the underbrush. Jesus, what is that? I asked Arno, to no response, who quietly chambered around into his rifle and motioned for me to do the same. Even with the deafening splattering of rain, I pulled the bolt on my rifle back as quietly and slowly as I could. Having noticed all the commotion, Dr. Frensby inquired as to what was going on, but it was quickly shushed by the concentrated hunter. Another deep rumble sounded, and the tree stand once again shook violently. And then another, followed by yet another. Whatever it was, was coming closer. With each vibration, large ripples formed on the puddles of mud down below, and the distressed, and the distressed gorilla fueled by adrenaline hopelessly pulled at its chains. What is going on? Please, just talk to me. Dr. Fernsby demanded in a frustrated manner. For the last time, be quiet. Arno hissed at the doctor. The sound of a large branch snapping in half shot past the noise of the heavy downpour. And through the thick rainfall, I could make out a large shadow slowly emerging from the vegetation, about seven meters above the gorilla. I zoomed in with my goggles to get a closer look at the shape. I think Arno did too, as I heard his goggle emit a low whir. High above in the tree line, at the edge of the forest, right behind where the gorilla sat, an enormous scaly snout had emerged from the leaves. Attached to the long snout were a set of large, sharp serrated teeth. It almost resembled the snout of a crocodile, except this was way more rounded and broad in its design. The rest of the head was still concealed behind the dense foliage, making it impossible to get a better look at the rest of the creature. In the bright green of the night vision goggles, I could see vents of steam shoot out of the beast's nostrils as it exhaled. You ought to see this, doctor, I said, taking off my night vision goggles and passing them over to Frensby. He put them on and searched around in the darkness for a while, until he abruptly stopped and gasped. Even without the goggles, I could still make out the dark shape of the creature's snout poking out of the tree line just over a hundred meters away. Remarkable, Fernsby proclaimed, trying to zoom in with his goggles. A new species of megafauna, never before observed by the eyes of science. If we're lucky, we might get to name it, I jokingly said to him, trying to hide the nervous undertones in my voice. I could tell the doctor was awestruck, but I didn't quite share the same feeling. Sure, the creature didn't look like a threat from way over there, but that head was suspended high off the ground, maybe high enough it could reach the tree stand if it came over here. No, I didn't feel a sense of joy at this new discovery. I felt horror. Faster than the blink of an eye, the large beast came crashing down through the foliage and wrapped its twisted jaws around the torso of the poor gorilla. I witnessed in horror as I saw the ape being lifted high up in the air by the monster. The gorilla's chain snapped as the large beast shook its prey from side to side. It then put the great ape down on the ground and began tearing off large chunks of its flesh. Due to the dark, I thankfully couldn't make out all the gory details. I looked over to Arno, who had raised his rifle in preparation of shooting the large beast. However, I could see that he too was terrified. Below, I could hear the nauseating sound of flesh ripping and bones cracking. Just from its dark silhouette, I could tell the beast was massive. It stood maybe six or seven meters tall, or around twenty feet for you Americans. It seemed to be mainly bipedal although it alternated between using its massive forelimbs for support. The creature had a long and thick tail 
covered in scales which it used for balancing itself. When it was done eating, it lifted its enormous head and sniffed in the air. Steam oozed out of its nostrils with each sniff. In the faint moonlight, I could see the reflective glistening of blood around its mouth. Had it caught on to our scent? It let out a deep snarl and took a few steps towards us. The ground shook each time one of the animal's powerful hind legs slammed into the ground. And gave him the goggles. Horn whispered to Fernsby. He needs them to see what he's shooting. Fernsby handed over the goggles. And once again, I quickly put them back on. In shades of nauseating green, I could see the monstrosity in way more detail now. A thick plumage of what looked like feathers covered its rigid back. My gaze shifted to the head of the creature. It had large reptilian eyes, with small cartilaginous ridges rising above each eye socket, probably to shade them from sunlight during the day. Jesus Christ, what does that buyer even want with a freak of nature like that? Fernsby whispered. Power, I'm guessing. Arnold replied. He is a warlord after all. There is no way he could ever get control over that thing. I shut in. Agreed. Then, to everyone's surprise, the headlight beams of the flatbed truck suddenly turned on and illuminated the right side of the animal. The large animal cocked its head and walked over to the vehicle in which the two mercenaries sat. No, no, no. Turn it off. Turn it off. I heard Arnold whisper under his breath, readying his rifle. Down below, I could hear frantic shouting in a language I didn't understand. The beast lowered its head right beside the front door of the cabin and used one of its big eyes to peer in through the windows. The shouting abruptly came to an end. The beast let out an ear-piercing roar, and in one fluid motion, it swung its head and sank its sharp teeth into the metal exterior of the truck. It bit down and tore off the roof of the truck cabin. Arnold and I raised our rifles and shot at the creature. It didn't even flinch. With my night vision goggles, I could see the two men cowering in their seats. One of them unbuckled his seatbelt and exited the truck on the opposite side of the creature. The remaining man fumbled with his buckle, but couldn't get free. And the creature cocked its head curiously to look at the trapped mercenary. I reloaded my rifle and took another shot at the beast. It had no effect. The creature came crashing down on the truck. The mercenary screamed as the animal ripped him from his seat and lifted him into the air. The screams came to a sudden stop as the beast raised back its head and swallowed the man whole. A loud shouting could be heard coming from the left side of the large animal. The other man stood out in the middle of the forest clearing. He shouted as he raised an assault rifle and took aim. Before the man could pull the trigger, the monster grabbed him with one of its forearms and raised him high over the ground. Arno took another shot. A loud crackle sounded, and a bright flash appeared around the man. The animal loosened his grip, and the mercenary fell face down into the wet mud. He had used his stun baton to get free. The man crawled along the wet forest floor in an attempt to escape. The large animal caught up to him and pressed one of his legs down onto the man's back, crushing him and leaving a massive three-toed footprint of blood and gore. It bent down to feast on what remained of the poor fellow. In unison, we both took yet another shot at the creature. This time, it flinched and snapped its head toward the location of the tree stand. It bellowed in agony and began making its way to where we sat perched. Just as I was about to take another shot, my rifle jammed. I tilted it to the side to see that an empty cartridge had gotten itself stuck in between the chamber and the bolt, slightly poking out. In a panic, I looked over to Arno, hoping he would know how to fix it. Pull the bolt back, damn it! He shouted. I did as he said, but it wouldn't nudge. I felt the ground tremble beneath me as the creature stood only a few meters away. In a panic, I dropped my rifle just as the powerful jaws of the animal bit down onto the platform. It shook its head from side to side in an attempt to detach the tree stand. 
I fell backwards on the floor, landing on my side. My night vision goggles slipped off my head and slid down off the platform, disappearing into the dark shrubbery below. The beast let go of the platform and instead walked to the side of the stand. It circled us for a while, snarling and growling while it was trying to figure out how to get to us. Then, it stopped to our right. Somehow, it had identified the support cables that held the tree stand in its place. It hissed and tore at them with its powerful claws, until finally, the sound of a taut metal cable going limp filled my ears with dread. Hold on to something, Dr. Fernsby shouted at the top of his lungs, just as the tree stand lost its balance and tipped over. I grabbed the metal railing and braced for impact, but it never came. We never hit the ground. The stand hung suspended at a 60 degree angle from one of the remaining support cables. Bags, boxes and crates slid down the wet floor past me and fell down into the jungle below. The creature roared beneath me. It sounded like a chorus of rusty chairs being dragged across the concrete floor. I looked around to see that Dr. Fernsby held on to true life by one of the rails on the opposite side of the platform. But there was no sign of Arnold the Hunter. Below, I could see the open jaws of the animal snapping after my legs. I was just out of reach. Then, to my horror, the railing bent and bent until it finally snapped, sending me falling for what felt like an eternity. I hit the wet mud of the forest floor with a soft thud and saw that my colleague also lay beside me, unmoving and covered in dirt. Still no sign of Arno. I quickly rose to my feet and rushed over to help Fernsby when a large shadow cast itself on the ground beneath, ominously looming over us. I brushed mud and water out of my eyes to see the animal standing a short distance away, looking down at us. It cocked its head, and I could see its sore muscles tensing in anticipation of leaping forwards. Then, someone's loud shouting filled the air. Arno stood in the middle of the clearing, holding his rifle. He waved to one of his arms and continued shouting. He had managed to capture the creature's attention, and the large beast turned towards him. My ears rang as he shot at the creature. He wasn't using the tranquilizing darts anymore. The beast let out an agonizing roar and began running in his direction. Seeing my opportunity, I helped Fernsby get to his feet, and we made a run for the Humvee parked right beside the now ravaged flatback truck. Lucky for us, the keys were still in the ignition. I slammed my foot down at the gas pedal, and the tires began spinning, slinging mud in every direction before the vehicle finally started moving forward. Through the windshield, I could see the massive beast standing in the middle of the clearing, partially illuminated by the headlights of the truck. In the creature's mouth, Arno hung from his left arm, writhing in pain. A thick stream of blood ran down the arm and covered the hunter's body in a sickly shade of crimson red. The animal bit down, and Arno fell to the ground. He clutched at his severed arm and cried out in pain. The animal's head then pummeled down, and the screaming finally stopped. I turned the car around and drove onto the dilapidated dirt road we had arrived on. Palm trees and jungle vines passed by as I floored the gas pedal. Behind, I could feel the ground trembling, and in the rearview mirror, I could see the beast giving chase. It took long and powerful strides, swiftly and elegantly running on its hind legs. It reminded me of the way a large terrestrial bird would run, like an ostrich or an emu. The large carnivore had started gaining on us, quickly covering great distances with each step it took. And then, it stopped. It just stood there in the middle of the road. Had it suddenly decided to give up? Just like that? In the rearview mirror, the creature gradually began shrinking. It let out a final bellowing roar. Before it disappeared into the thick jungle by the side of the road. The rubber windshield wipers 
and desperately wiped away the pattering rain of the glass of the Humvee as I continued to speed down the muddy thoroughfare. As we rounded a sharp turn, my eyes were drawn to the dismantled jeep that laid upside down in a ditch on the side of the road. Its tires were ripped off, the tail lights blinking a bright red, and large claw marks ran along its side. Since we were moving so fast, I didn't get the chance to properly investigate the scene. But as I sped past, I could have sworn I saw a white blazer covered in specks of crimson hanging from a branch on a nearby tree. It took us no more than two days to leave the country and fly back to England. We didn't bother trying to report our experience to the local authorities back in Congo. We didn't expect they would believe us anyway. And we definitely didn't want to get into any trouble. We packed our bags and left with the first plane available. Dr. Fernsby is still a little shaken up after the traumatic incident. But he is mostly fine. This all happened a few years ago. But I felt it was important we finally share what happened to us that fateful day in the humid jungles of the Congo Basin. As of late, I've seen news articles online detailing discoveries of ravaged towns in the Congolese countryside. The few remaining survivors blame the disaster on an entity they call Mokele Mbembe. When I first read it, I knew I heard the name from somewhere before. And then, chills shivered down my spine as I recalled the last words of the brave mercenary. In his final moments, he had called the beast Mokele Mbembe as well. I've done some research and I've come to find Mokele Mbembe describing a large quadrupedal animal or water spirit that resides in lakes and rivers. Mokele Mbembe is described as an herbivorous reptile possessing a long neck, like that of a sauropod dinosaur. Some people believe Mokele Mbembe is living proof that Mesozoic era dinosaurs survived into this modern world, previously thought to have gone extinct around 65 million years ago. However, the description of Mokele Mbembe does not match the beast I encountered that night many years ago. The creature I encountered certainly didn't have an abnormally long neck, and it for sure wasn't herbivorous. This begs the question, are there more of them out there, different species? Is there an undiscovered ecosystem thriving in the deep recesses of the Congo Basin, waiting to be discovered? According to the Congolese government, around 80% of the jungle around the northeastern part of the country remains uncharted. Who knows what mysteries are left to unfold? What wonders, secrets and horrors are left to be observed under the watchful eyes of scientists? I've made attempts to contact Dr. Fernsby. But I have, as of this moment, not received any response. I'm using my university to try and raise funding for this next expedition. And so far, the council seems to be on board with the idea. Of course, I haven't told them everything. Not yet, anyway. Ever since that night, I have had an obsessive compulsion to return to the jungle. The law of adventure and discovery is calling upon me. I have to go back. I have to know. If something has survived 